Welcome to Taking Note, episode 14. I'm Eddie Manessis. Today is July 3rd. Uh, how do you guys like the new logo? I made some prototypes. I worked really hard on it. I didn't know it would take so much work to create a logo, but I went on canva.com, put together three templates, sent them out to some friends, and uh, got the votes back, and two of them were neck and neck, so I basically just combined them, and now I have my new logo. So let me know in the comments how you like the new logo, and how do you like the new page? That, that was also kind of a, a lot of work. I'm just kind of learning as I go here, I guess, as anyone does when they start a new venture, but it's been really exciting to see all the support, see all the people uh, following the new page and everything, and I hope uh, just to gain more followers week after week and more people on more people's eyes on this on this interview thank you diana morgan she says love she loves the new page thank you uh yeah so very excited about that hopefully these are new beginnings hopefully you know i can keep doing the show and and uh, things go progress from here so i don't know not not a super eventful week i'm just going to talk a bit while we get more people tuning in here I, uh, for those of you who have watched my episodes before and my intros in number like episodes three and four, I talked about how I was going off coffee and, uh, and then I was back on coffee and now I am off coffee again. I don't know what it is about it. I, I'm, I'm just realizing my addiction to it. I, uh, but it's driving me up the wall. It gives me so much anxiety when I drink coffee, but I'm so addicted to the smell of it in the morning, making it, the ritual of making it, picking out the beans, all that kind of snobbery that goes along with making good coffee. And man, I miss all of that. But I don't know, something happened after the age of 35. All of a sudden, my brain was just like, you are now sensitive to these things that you used to love. So I think coffee's just going to be relegated to something I do on vacation every once in a while and only before I'm about to do some sort of rigorous physical activity. Otherwise, it just feels like my heart and my head are going to explode. So no coffee. I guess it's a little bit of sad news. I'm going to miss it. RIP coffee in my life. But uh, every once in a while, I guess. As always, please like, comment, and share. Thank you, you, thank you so much to all of your support and, and all of you who have shared this podcast in the past. Really appreciate it. That's the number one way you can help me out is just by clicking that share button. It takes one second. Click it. Share it to your profile. Share this interview live. Get more eyeballs on it. If you have a friend you think might be interested in this series, give them a text. Show, show them where my profile is or tell them where my profile is. Send them a link. And we're good to go. I'd really appreciate the help. Really appreciate the help in the past. Uh, keep it going. Let's keep this, this train moving. So yes, please like, comment, and share it. Anytime during this discussion, if you have a comment, or any questions at all, please put them in the chat. We will get to it at some point. I really encourage audience participation. It's key to the conversation. It really helps drive conversation. And I look forward to seeing everyone's comments and questions as we go along. It's really appreciated in the past. So yes, like, comment, and share, please. Thank you. So my guest today has a truly wonderful and creative multifaceted career. He studied bassoon at the University of Memphis, and then again at USC, he got his master's degree. He has appeared with many ensembles across the country as both a soloist and a performer. He's a host and producer of Music Through the Night, which airs on American Public Media and Minnesota Public Radio. He is the executive producer and co-host of the podcast Triloquy, which explores classical music relationship to race and racism. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to bring you Garrett McQueen. Garrett, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me today. Yeah, of course. Uh, how you doing, man? How you doing with this this lockdown and and everything that's going on? Uh, so you live in Minnesota, right? So you're kind of in the epicenter of uh, many things right now. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, my my world uh, didn't so much uh, change as as a lot of people's uh, did. You know, as a as a radio host and a, a content creator, uh, my my calendar kind of stacked up when uh, the world shut down. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been uh, chugging along uh, the best I can. I think um, we've we've all learned um, more about ourselves and our relationship uh, with home over these past uh, several months. Uh, I've I've personally um, engaged um, a better relationship with my kitchen lately instead of a uh, <laughs> rub hub and restaurants yeah. and different things. So um, it's it's come with its challenges as it has for everyone, I'm sure. But uh, hanging on and uh, chugging along. 
It's good to hear, man. It's good to hear. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you're staying busy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Being a radio host, it seems like this is crunch time for you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, while we're on the topic of radio, let's. That's kind of my first question. What first sparked your interest in radio? How did you kind of expand your musical career into the radio scene, and how did you go about pursuing that aspect of it? Sure. The uh, the not so long answer to that is. Um, when I was playing down uh, in Knoxville, I spent five seasons uh, as the second bassoon of the Knoxville Symphony. Um, I think at the beginning of my fourth season, uh, a position came open at the local public radio station. They were looking for a, a temporary fill-in for um, an afternoon uh, classical spot. I thought it might uh, be a fun and interesting way to uh, make a little extra money, actually. So um, I, I went out for it, uh, and they took me. Um, at the end of the uh, temporary uh, part uh, of the contract, um, they decided to um, keep me on, and um, that that led to all sorts of things, including uh, content that I created uh, for WUOT at the intersection of uh, classical music and race. Mm -hmm. um, that um, that sort of uh, started to get a bit of national attention. I was invited uh, to speak on the topic uh, at several uh, convenings uh, and places, including the Sphinx uh, Conference. Uh, I gave a, a talk at the Kennedy Center, you know, many other mm. places. Um, along the way, um, I caught the attention of the folks at American Public Media and mm. uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. So uh, on a trip uh, where I was subbing with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra on, on a non-radio trip, uh, I, I visited St. Paul for the first time. Uh, folks at American Public Media reached out. Uh, we scheduled a lunch. Um, and as I say, uh, three months later, they invited me to apply uh, for a job. And three months after that, um, I packed up a U-Haul and uh, moved my life from Tennessee to Minnesota. Wow. So did you did you leave the orchestra for, for that or... Yeah, I, I left the orchestra. I, I left uh, all sorts of stuff. And, um, you know, the, the way I frame that is um, uh, a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So um, and, and I'm sure we'll get more into this later, but uh, I, I've been uh, uniquely positioned to uh, speak on certain things based on uh, my experience as a professional musician, uh, my experience as a black man uh, in America and, and everything in between. You know, when you put everything together, um, I, I felt like I had a responsibility to um, speak for those and, and speak of those and, and shine a light on folks. Um, who haven't uh, been heard, who haven't always been centered in so many of these conversations. So uh, while leaving, um, while I haven't completely left the bassoon behind, I, I mm -hmm. still play. I don't play as uh, nearly as often uh, as, I, as I used to. I just sort of consider it um, a, a personal sacrifice that I made um, for a cause that's um, bigger than me, that's bigger mm -hmm. than my career as a bassoonist, uh, even bigger than my career as a radio host. I, I see it as a responsibility uh, to, to use uh, my, my uh, unique experiences and those intersections as a means of expanding uh, more conversations in, in, uh, in so-called classical music. Right, so-called classical music. I've heard you use that phrase many times. It's a very good term. Um, so... Well, so then, so th is that what kind of spurred the idea to create Triloquy, your podcast? Is that is that just kind of extension, an extension of that feeling of responsibility to highlight these voices and talk about your experience and other people's experiences to bring them into the light? Sure. So um, a, a talent and a passion of mine uh, that I actually discovered uh, while working at WUOT down in uh, Knoxville uh, was that I liked um, talking with people, that I liked uh, giving interviews. Um, just as an aside, you know, uh, before I got into uh, radio, I was supplementing my income with the symphony um, as a bartender, something that I've done mm. for, for years and years. So, you know, my ability to just kind of talk to people and engage conversation translated really well on the content uh, creation side. So yeah. when I got um, to, when I, when I came here to St. Paul, um, many, many different things came together in my desire to um, start a podcast, my uh, my talking with people and engaging conversations uh, being one of those things. Uh, but mainly the idea that the content didn't really exist. So, uh, mm. you know, a after moving to uh, St. Paul, I learned uh, the harshness of Minnesota winters, mm -hmm. uh, winters that my Mini Cooper couldn't really uh, <laughs> navigate so well. So I became really well acquainted with public uh, uh, transit. Mm -hmm. And you know, in those comings and goings, 
um, I, I started to listen to all sorts of podcasts and, and YouTube shows, and um, I saw a lot of overlap in the conversations that were happening, despite the uh, the focus of the podcasts um, being starkly different. Um, I felt like classical music, so-called classical music, wasn't engaging uh, some of those conversations to the extent um, that I feel like we should, that I felt like that I could. Um, so, um, so those two things, you know, my love for talking with people, um, and, and the responsibility I felt to expand some of these conversations went into, uh, the creation, uh, of, of the podcast Triloquy. So that started, um, the, uh, the, uh, let, let, let's see, the, the skeleton, the skeletal, um, Portions began in December of 2018, uh, February of 2019. Uh, we started pulling things together, and uh, me and my co-host Scott. And uh, in May of uh, 2019, we launched the uh, very first opus of the podcast. Mm -hmm. so, uh, a couple months ago, we actually celebrated our one-year anniversary. Oh, congratulations! Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've really enjoyed the podcast ever since I discovered it. It's, it's. I really love. It. It's just such a creative concept. Uh, they're really great, important conversations, but I love all the tie-ins to so-called classical music, how each episode is called an opus, and it's done in four movements. The first movement is accidentals, right, where you give sharps and flats to various things, and then you have struck a chord, movement two, things that struck a chord with you that week. Movement three is typically the interview, and then movement four is the triloquy, where it's, uh, from my understanding, the triloquy is, uh, can you explain the triloquy, the word, and, and what that means in the fourth movement of each of these episodes? Sure. So what I knew I wanted to bring to the field as far as a podcast at the intersection of classical music and contemporary culture um, was uh, an unapologetic uh, perspective. So um, understanding that uh, we wanted uh, the title of the podcast to have something music related, uh, we got to the word trill. So, you know, folks who are musicians know what a trill is, you mm -hmm. know, a move mm -hmm. between uh, two or more, um, or more notes um, rapidly. Um, but, it's, but it's also a word that I always used growing up, you know, uh, me and my friends, my homies, we use the word trill as sort of unapologetically true. So you can think of it as um, a combining of the words true and real. So, mm -hmm. you know, with the word trill being colloquial and musical, uh, we decided to match that with the idea of a colloquy or a soliloquy, the idea of talking, telling stories, mash those together, uh, and, and we came up with triloquy. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so a, a, as you've asked, you know, in the final, and, and we've definitely um, switched up the format of the podcast since the um, the one year reunion. But um, a, as you mentioned, uh, they're they're now in four movements, with that final movement being the triloquy. So mm -hmm. the, the way that Scott and I think about that is um, just our final thoughts um, that are uh, true and real and um, unapologetic. So just as an example for folks uh, listening, uh, in the latest opus of uh, Triloquy, my final movement, my Triloquy, um, was about um, an article that um, sort of stated William Levi Dawson's Negro Folk Symphony as, um, you know, this undiscovered piece of music that I think the headline read, finally, someone remembered this piece of music. Well, you know, it, it begs the question, you know, for folks like me, well, who ever forgot? This is a piece of music that, you know, we've always engaged. These are aesthetics and conversations. When you talk about the Negro spiritual and how that plays a role in this so-called classical music, you know, we've always been there. So um, it's, it, it's all about, um, you know, changing the perspective, uh, changing uh, who is centered in the conversation and doing so um, in a in an unapologetic way, in a really trill way, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that concept. And uh, off that off that article you just mentioned, so yeah, there is a general lack of awareness amongst non people of color, uh, and and so let, let's go on the topic of music education and your concept of music as edu education is actually more like music assimilation where we're educated, we have our music history classes, but it is very Eurocentric, the scope is very narrow. And I'll just talk about my experience. We learn about all these uh, white male composers from Europe, uh, you know, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and then, you know, some Finnish composers. You barely learn about any female composers unless they're kind of related to the male composers. And <clears throat> certainly, I can't remember a single African-American composer uh, that I was taught. I never remember learning about a single African-American composer until you get to the jazz era, which in that system 
would give someone the perception that there were no black composers or performers before that time and that it just doesn't exist. So, so let's go, can you kind of expound on that, on that topic and, and how you've experienced it in your musical training? Sure. So to get into that, I kind of have to get, um, into my so-called origin story. So, um, I grew up up in Memphis, Mm -hmm. which is a, a mostly, um, black city. Uh, you, you aren't really in too many, uh, rooms as the only black person in a place like Memphis. So that counted for my schooling and up into uh, my undergraduate career. And I was fortunate enough to uh, study at the University of Memphis under Lacoli in Washington. He now lives um, in Boston. But um, so, you, you know, having a black a bassoon teacher, my very first um, uh, bassoon teacher, uh, being a black person and growing up in a black city, um, in, in a way sort of um, uh, cut me off at the knees as far as uh, the way uh, most people might think of the genre. I didn't think of it as a white thing. I thought of it as something that included all of us. Um, but as I, I as I got further and further up into my education and into my career, I saw that that idea was not reflected in what we were taught. And um, and 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 grappling with that uh, for years and years, you know, I, I reached back out to um, Lacoli, and we we still have a great relationship. And he is actually who introduced me to the idea of a music education being a music assimilation. And as, and as soon as he said that, so much um, cleared up for me. So, um, and, and an analogy of that I kind of thought of in preparation uh, for this conversation was learning the English language. So imagine if um, we learned the English language with our only sort of, um, our, our only reference being the Bible that the Bible being the only words, the only means we have of learning English. Well, sure, we will learn English, but a lot would come with that, right? There, there, were, there would be aspects beyond linguistics that um, have an impact on our lives because we were taught in that very uh, rigid and specific way. And the same counts for, um, uh, for, for classical music, uh, so-called classical music. When we think about what we were taught um, and think about what was centered, um, you know, we have to acknowledge that the way we think about pitch is rooted in that Western aesthetic. You know, people um, have 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 already um, acknowledged that you know our 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 scale is very different than scales of the East of of the Middle East and other parts in the world. You know, but the way that we think about pitch uh, specifically is rooted in that Western aesthetic. Think about the concepts of melody. What were some of the first melodies that we learned to play? It wasn't the music that we were engaging at home or, or with our parents right. or with our friends. It was call Aunt Rhody, whoever Aunt Rhody is, and right. Hot Cross Runs, and, yeah, and all of that. Mice, same thing. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, all of that stuff. You know, uh, the, the concept of composition. If we're, as you've mentioned, um, if we're not taught about black composers and black music, music creators, and, and we only center it um, on those dead white men from Europe, you know, what are we supposed to think of the concept of, of composition? And then I think um, the, the biggest and, and the most impactful um, aspect of this conversation is how we consider quality and excellence. The, the, mm-hmm. the way that we define a quality performance, an excellent performance, is all rooted in those things that I've mentioned. And those things are rooted in whiteness, in the tradition of Western Europe. So, um, so, so that's why I talk about music education being music assimilation. We're not only taught music, but we're taught that there are certain types of music that are superior, and there are certain ways of um, engaging music that are superior. So a big mm-hmm. part of my is opening people's eyes up to that reality to help them sort of see um, the ways in which they were assimilated and the ways in which they can uh, uh, have corrective action against it. Mm. So it's kind of like an indoctrination when you're exactly and you're just kind of brainwashed and like this is the yeah it's very rigid this is the way it is this is what matters this is the quality so I mean let's let's go deeper into that what uh with the concept of pitch and the concept of this like being very Western and this is the right way and what does quality mean? What what does quality mean? What can quality mean? That's an interesting question. I, I think um, the way I will boil down quality is its relevance to um, a, a person. 
and, and to a time and, and to a space. I mean, just to, you know, just, just to go back to education um, for a minute. So um, I think we all, most folks who have, uh, you know, majored in music have had to take those methods classes that include piano. So um, for me and my undergraduate, you know, uh, those piano, and I had to take four years of piano. It was excruciating for me. Mm. I, I really hated it. Um, years later, um, at, you know, after I had gotten into radio, actually, um, for some reason, I decided to buy a keyboard. Uh, they were on a Black Friday sale or something. Mm -hmm. And um, I started by just learning the chord progressions of songs that I um, enjoy listening to. Anyone who follows me um, on Instagram and other social media may know that um, I'll, I'll, I'll get on and, and sing a song in front of the piano uh, every now and again. You know, that my, my love and my appreciation for that instrument and, and the excellence that I could ex uh, execute through it came alive when the means of my doing that was more culturally uh, relevant. If, mm. if that makes sense. So, yeah. you know, when I when I think about excellence, I, I think about how something fits into someone's life. So it, it doesn't so much matter to me if someone um, misses uh, a, a, an F sharp in, in, in whatever can if the experience for me was was impactful and, and relevant. But uh, so so often we've um you know, reduced the performance of this so-called classical music to just being a, a technician. You know, what what dynamics were hit, what dynamics weren't hit, what what mm -hmm. notes were missed, and not that those things aren't important, but uh, I think we've kind of lost sight um, of the the means and 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 the roles uh, that this music can play. I, I think it's something that folks are uh, beginning to uh, take a second look at uh, these days in, in, in light of everything. But um, it, it's a it's a generations long problem. Um, that that has been perpetuated by uh, you know the way we record music, uh, the way the way we rehearse. Maybe those are uh, other conversations. But uh, yeah, but basically my my long way of saying that I, I uh, consider and define excellence by um, the role it plays um, in time and space uh, and, and in a person's uh, 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 experience with consuming music. Mm -hmm. Was that kind of general rigidity of classical music the perfectionistic attitude the playing you know missing one note being live or die for every note was that did that kind of make your transition easier what did it make your decision kind of easy to leave the orchestra and go to do this uh to go into radio and podcasting and kind of spread these ideas yeah um it, it was it was not an easy decision uh, at all. I mean, any any anyone uh, uh, listening or watching who um, uh, is a professional musician or an aspiring uh, professional musician, you know, think about what you would walk away from it all for. You know, um, it, it would have to be something pretty big. You know, mm -hmm. so. For, for me, this was that, you know, it, it was a very hard decision uh, for me to to leave the stage, but um, uh, a necessary decision. Mm -hmm. So going back to that concept of quality being kind of a very personal thing uh, based on someone's experience, does that kind of just blow up the entire musical education system? Like how, how can that be... I mean, how can that be incorporated into a music music education system where you're teaching a bunch of different people who have different concepts of what quality means to them and what is relevant to them when they're learning music and excites them about learning music? Yeah, I, I think you're touching on the question of how do you teach creativity, which is OK. It's it's difficult. Um, I, I think. Uh, a lot of it is rooted in experience. So, you know, uh, a 17 year old, an 18 year old does not have the life experience of a 50 year old. You know, that there, there are certain things that just uh, can't change that. But um, there has to be a way uh, when we're when we're teaching music for um, for the principal role to be what it's for and, and what idea uh, we're, we're trying to uh, push forward or what experience we're, we're trying to offer to someone. Um, but, you know, I think it's safe to say that the focus now is, is still, you know, the the technical side, the um, the the left. I always get the left brain, right brain analogy mixed up. But, you know, the, the <laughs> side of the brain that, you know, is it, it, focused in on, on the on the mathematic aspect of, of this so-called classical music. And again, not that that isn't important, but um, it, it, it shows itself in the way that we don't really engage music uh, very often, uh, fill with the emotion that we could. Um, you know, uh, next week um, on the Triloquy podcast, um, I'm actually going to talk about 
um, a fairly controversial figure, um, uh, a man named Louis Farrakhan, for, for mm. folks who um, have, have, have heard of him. And um, there's a video of him playing uh, the opening movement of Mendelssohn's uh, Violin Concerto on YouTube. I, I really encourage everyone to go look at that because what you see is an audience really engaged with the experience. They're clapping um, you know, after the after the, uh, the the solo sections, you know, during the 2D sections, mm. they're engaging with uh, every, you know, note he's playing, every phrase he's playing. Um, I think that's the, uh, more of the experience that folks want uh, the concert hall to be. Mm -hmm. um, we aren't ready to make uh, the sacrifices uh, that are necessary. And I think one of those sacrifices is uh, challenging the way we've thought about this so-called excellence when it comes to the performance of music. We have to do a better job of teaching the next generation and teaching ourselves that um, that there is emotion, there's feeling, there's life experience that has to come through this music more than right notes and right rhythms because mm -hmm. there th isn't much emotion um, in that. Why, why do you think that that musicians and and audience members are so resistant to that in the orchestral world. I, I know that I see that in my own life and when I'm working with people, anytime an orchestra presents like a change or they want to do some like really kind of innovative programming or progressive programming, there's so much pushback and there's pushback from audiences, pushback from older uh, uh, orchestra members who are just just stuck in this kind of anachronistic way and they are so stuffy and stubborn about it like i it seems like you're just between a rock and a hard place like how how do we affect this type of change well i i, I think it's safe to say that in general uh folks are um uncomfortable with change people are uncomfortable with being uncomfortable and that's what we're seeing um in in so-called classical music so um, in, in season one of uh, the Triloquy podcast, I interviewed um, a young man named David Norville, who um, recently graduated from the New England Conservatory, uh, an oboist. And um, he, he called classical music, specifically the concert hall experience, one of the last unchallenged vertices of white supremacy uh, in America and in the world. Now think mm. about that. Think, think about the, the tradition of going into the concert hall and this orchestral experience. It's much older than um, the contemporary conversations of race that we're having. It's older than America itself. So this is, so th th this is a norm that has been uh, codified uh, for so long. Mm -hmm. And um, now that it's finally being challenged, um, people are uh, people are uncomfortable now. You know, in, in light of the tragic um, murder of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others, you know, folks are um, finally deciding um, to uh, consider some of these conversations that lead to uh, some of these uh, changes. But I, I think the short answer is that. Um, folks don't like being uncomfortable. The concert hall, the idea of the orchestral experience has been this safe space for, um, for white people. Mm -hmm. And now that that's being challenged, um, there, there's a lot of uh, discourse. There's a lot of uh, discomfort. And um, it, it, it's, it's one of you know, the, the million reasons that I do the work I do. We have to open up this space uh, for more people if we want classical music to survive. Because quite frankly, uh, what we're seeing right now is that it wasn't relevant enough to survive the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So is it, is, is it relevant enough to survive um, the, the other challenges that lay ahead of us? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to admit, I was so unaware of that concept like the, the the white supremacy of orchestras and orchestras being racist it was such it was it was on kind of a periphery to me i only heard anecdotes like in my i went to carnegie mellon for grad school i studied with tim adams uh, who's a black percussionist and i remember him telling a story once when he first got into the pittsburgh symphony he was standing outside heinz hall uh you know before a concert just you know on his phone and an older white couple came up and handed them their keys because he just thought that he was the valet and he told I was like wow but that that doesn't really happen that much right you know that that's not that's just like a that's a east that's like an old orchestra thing that's you know we're in a conservative neighbor that would never happen elsewhere right so he should have kept the car yeah yeah uh i just yeah i uh, i guess i'm battling with my own lack of awareness in in this time and um i know we talked about that before we got on here about uh how i mentioned uh, a lot of people are becoming more aware and a lot of stuff is coming to light in 
the wake of all this police brutality and the death of George Floyd and Ryan Taylor and, and uh, Elijah McClain. And, uh, and you said, yeah, coming to light for who? So uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm sorry, I'm just kind of rambling, but do you have thoughts on that? People who have been aware for a long time and people who are just now kind of waking up to this? Well, first and foremost, I'm so glad that um, you used a word that I don't bring up in interviews until the interviewer brings it up, the word racist or mm -hmm. racism. OK, um, I think um, in light of everything um, uh, we've been forced, well, you know, many people who who have not traditionally engaged these conversations have been forced to even rethink that word. So, you know, racism being racist isn't just um, a set of of ideals or, or using the N-word or, or handing a black musician the keys to your car, assuming that he's a, a valet. You know, it's, it's action and it's tradition. So it's very important for us to name the American orchestra as a racist institution because it has rooted in, itself in a culture that um, more often than not, more and more often than not, does not speak to the people who, who live um, and work in those communities, you know, uh, there, there would be no uh, question um, about the, the backlash if someone like, I don't know, the L.A. Phil or the, or the New York Philharmonic uh, said, we are only, um, uh, for, the, for, for here on out, we are only programming composers who are black. OK, there would be a big outcry, wouldn't there? Mm -hmm. Where was that outcry for the past however many years when so many of these seasons only included white composers and furthermore, white men uh, composers? So um, so so naming naming that racism, I think, is one of the first steps toward um, remedying this. Now, it goes far beyond um, putting Florence Price and William Grant still um, on, on your programming as well. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's making sure that your boards are diverse, that your offices and that your leaderships um, are, are diverse. I think a lot of orchestras have done an okay job over the uh, recent years of diversifying uh, what audiences see um, on stage, but um, we, we have to do so much more for that diversity to begin to reflect itself in the audience. And, and, and I think that, um, th that that goes all the way down to the way uh, we consider certain conversations including naming orchestras as racist institutions. Once we can really have that conversation comfortably, we can begin to uh, create a space in which uh, more people uh, feel seen in that space. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. we aren't right there yet. Mm -hmm. Well, it just seems like historically, you know, just America, as the U.S. as a country has had obviously incredible difficulty grappling with its its history of slavery and then Jim Crow and then the war on drugs, uh, prison industrial complex. How, with all the weight of that, how how does it change now? Like how, I don't know, yeah, how does it change now? Like with, with all that behind us and all that to grapple with and people being so resistant to it, how do these conversations happen for people who are still being incredibly resistant to it? You know, it's it's been said that um, freedom and justice can't be given. It can only be taken. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. I think with all of the uh, with all the riots and the protests, we're seeing um, things being taken. Uh, literally and figuratively. So a as it applies to classical music and the concert hall, I think it's uh, really going to take folks in positions of power and uh, in positions of change to um, take heed and 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 to uh, and to and and to make action uh, of that taking that's going to be required to to change uh, this landscape. What does that mean for me um, and my work? Um, it means that I make a point um, on the radio in um, highlighting um, uh, black composers, composers of color, women composers, living composers, not equally, but more than I shine a light on the canon because we've we've done that as it as it applies to uh, triloquy. You know, I take that bit of justice. I take that bit of freedom by speaking freely, by not allowing what I say 
um, to be ruled by um, the, 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 the overarching um, white-centered opinions that have been ubiquitous to classical music. What does that mean for the um, orchestral musician? Speaking up when uh, the conductor um, says or does something that's a problem. Going into the office, talking to the librarians and the personnel manager when you see not only a season, but a single concert that does not represent more than just the European uh, uh, a white male uh, center perspective on music. Uh, how, how does this conversation apply uh, to the music lover? Challenging your own institution, taking it upon yourself to go to your orchestra, to go to your local radio station, or however you um, consume or participate classical music, and and um, and letting them know that it's a time for radical change. Think about how much the world has changed. In, um, in 2020, you know, mm -hmm. a year ago, who would have believed that, you know, just about all restaurants would be closed, mm -hmm. that we'd be wearing masks, that, you know, social distancing would be a thing, you know, that, that, that that's a world that people couldn't really, um, wouldn't have been able to understand fully back in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so uh, sort of conversely, um, I, I think that reality, um, you know, getting back to your point about being resistant to change, it's a reality that people can't quite understand. People uh, can't wrap their minds around, you know, a, a Beyonce pops taking the front seat to a performance of, of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. You know, right, uh, right. it's not something that's going to happen organically. It's something that we have to take uh, for ourselves. Mm. OK, yeah, I mean, because. I mean that that kind of answers my other question about how how smaller orchestras would tackle that because I because I you know I live in L.A. I play with the L.A. Phil frequently and they do they have been doing that work and they are continuing to do that work and that work is they express how important that work is to them uh, highlighting people of color as artists and composers uh, they have a really good diversity fellowship that they you know and they treat those fellows just like members of the orchestra they play every week they are. Uh, like I know for the percussionist, at least Wesley Sumter, he is the fourth percussionist of that section. Um, but at the same, and they spend a ton of money on production, on advertising, and, and they can do it. You know, if it doesn't, if people don't like it, it doesn't matter because LA Phil has so much money. It's like, whatever, we'll keep programming whatever we want. It doesn't matter if you, if you really like it or not. But Say you you know you have something like the Midland Odessa Symphony, right? Who's dependent entirely on their on their donors. And they want to hear Beethoven and Mozart and Brahms. And you play one new thing and they complain about it. They make phone calls. You know, what, what can be done about that? Do you just kind of let that fail and, and build anew from there? Or what are your ideas around that? Yeah, con concerning the fellowship uh, programs, uh, I, I would be remiss if, if I didn't acknowledge that um, quite often those are um, violent and um, and uh, inequitable experiences for the fellows. You know, we mm. have to talk mm. about um, the white savior complex. We have to talk about if these fellows are actually being treated equally in in, in these positions and, and not as students or auxiliary players. You know, mm. so I, I just mm. want to um, make sure I, I name that. Um, as far as um, the smaller orchestras, so, you know, uh, something that I don't get to talk about a lot, but, you know, one of the things I'm so grateful for in my career is that leaving USC, I went straight to the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, this big organization, and then I moved on to the Knoxville Symphony, which um, is, is what I would call a, a medium-sized organization, certainly mm -hmm. one that's smaller than the, than the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Um, and, and in in, in that sort of dichotomous um, experience, um, I noticed that it's the smaller ensembles that are actually doing um, the, the more uh, so-called adventurous programming. Mm -hmm. So um, so if, if you go um, see a performance by the Knoxville Symphony, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's an orchestra down in Texas uh, that's... Um, that's, that, that, that I'm losing uh, right now, Grand Valley, or uh, maybe someone in the comments can remind me, you know, th or, or think about the Chicago Sinfonietta, you know, th th mm -hmm. these organizations that have been uh, foregrounding and focusing on diverse programming for years. And, and, and I think um, you can see that reverberate out into the communities. You have these large organizations like the LA Phil, uh, the New York Philharmonic, the Cleveland Orchestra, an, an organization that many would call America's greatest orchestra, that for their 100th um, anniversary only had uh, white male composers uh, program. That was for the entire year. So, mm. you know, 
um, as, as I was talking about earlier, about um, taking justice and, and taking equity. Um, we, have to, we have to become more comfortable with challenging these uh, large institutions. I think, um, at least in my experience, the smaller institutions um, have the room, and this counts for radio stations, this counts for um, uh, in independent content uh, creators, you know, those, uh, those, those smaller institutions really have the room um, to do the work. Um, while the big institutions just have not taken it upon themselves to show, um, you know, themselves as leaders um, in this field. It's something that I'm really hoping um, to see in the future because, quite frankly, with uh, the way conversations have been going on, um, I'm not sure anybody's rendition of a Beethoven or a Schubert symphony is going to uh, get me uh, into a coronavirus-filled concert hall. Not the, not, uh, the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra, mm -hmm. not the Cleveland Orchestra, not the Berlin Philharmonic or, or, or anyone. We really have to challenge the large institutions to, um, to put power uh, the, the the space and and more importantly the money that they have you know let let's let's expand this conversation beyond programming the mm -hmm. LA Philharmonic uh, and and I'm only using them as a as a uh, as an example I don't have any connections to the LA Phil but you know uh, th that orchestra has the means of of um, of, uh, of funding um, scholarships for 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 uh, young aspiring black musicians to mm -hmm. uh, by to provide uh, food banks and other support for the uh, downtown LA community um, and the surrounding areas in which they live. What could that organization do for um, the the homeless population, those uh, uh, the houseless populations, those living on Skid Row? You know, in what ways could these institutions uh, use that uh, capital to um, inspire change? Um, we have we have yet to see it, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. hopefully in the future. Yeah. Uh I think L.A. Phil through YOLA is doing uh, some of that. I certainly, I don't know if they're doing any public outreach in terms of, of the homeless population uh, or houseless, as, as you said. Um, but I know through YOLA they do provide scholarships. And uh, I feel like that is one good thing that is coming out of it, not coming out of this, but the work that L.A. Phil is doing and Gustavo Dudamel is doing through YOLA is that we are seeing kids who are coming from underprivileged neighborhoods getting uh, a, a music education and early access basically to high quality training or, you know, in the Western style, but they're getting high quality training and they are getting into these, you know, the, the top conservatories. And, and I feel like personally, that seems like a step in the right direction and, and, uh, and we'll soon see the effects of that in professional orchestras when these kids are graduating and they're on the audition circuit, if they choose to continue. Well, if I could butt in, you know, who sure. who um, who defines the top conservatories and the mm -hmm. top institutions? You know, who who decided that these schools were, were better than others? Who decided that these orchestras were better than others? You know, so mm -hmm. uh, and again, not to pick on uh, the, the L.A. Phil, but um, what what if um, they were able to facilitate a music education that expanded beyond this um, so-called classical music? What if they um, decided to facilitate um, an education that expanded uh, beyond music, giving uh, kids from um, marginalized communities the tools that they need to um, become doctors, to 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 become city planners, to become these um, to become these patrons that uh, orchestras like the LA Phil um, re rely on. So while um, while I think there are some good steps uh, being taken, I think we need to take um, a, a second look at some of these programs. Uh, mm -hmm. Large institutions like uh, like these big so-called top five, top ten American orchestras have the means of expanding their impact beyond um, Western classical music. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and as I said just a few moments ago, we have yet to see it, but hopefully we can see it in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Any of my friends in the LA Phil who are listening, I know you guys have been having Zoom meetings with management, maybe bring some of this up for the future. I know there have been talks about it, so... Uh, this would be a good thing to bring up. So can we can we go back to the what you talked about, what you mentioned about diversity programs? Let's talk about white saviorism and tokenism and how that impacts diversity programs. And maybe uh, we'll, we'll just stick to your personal experience uh, with your fellowship with the Detroit Symphony. Um, you know, by, by the time I had uh, joined the DSO, I had already um, celebrated. Uh, I was lucky enough to celebrate a few successes already. I actually uh, won a small job 
uh, before I, I went to USC, you know, and, and as you know, uh, living in LA, once you, uh, you know, shake the right hands and meet the right people, you know, you, you kind of become busy on the mm-hmm. scenes, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, having these high pressure um, and high impact gigs was something that I was, I was used to before I got to the uh, Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Now, uh, being put in a position of being uh, more of a student didn't necessarily uh, fit for me. I'm not mm-hmm. Excuse me. I'm, I'm not saying that um, everyone um, has had an, uh, a horrible experience in, in, in fellowship programs. Uh, I, I just think um, any institution that's trying to um, engage uh, black youth, uh, youth of color, youth from marginalized communities, um, they, they need to do a better job of meeting these folks where they are and serving them the best way we can. You know, and this ties back to what we just got done talking about. You know, what if these organizations um, you know, taught folks how to use um, microphones and headphones. You know, mm-hmm. you, you you started this new project. Mm-hmm. Well, what it, what those were tool sets that um, that that orchestras could facilitate. They have the capital. They have the means of doing it. They just have yet to. And and that's why the concert hall looks the way um, it does today. And um, quite frankly, I think that's why the uh, the concert halls um, look uh, empty today. Mm-hmm. I, I I think that. Um, I think that American orchestras um, could have uh, put themselves in the situation of having relevance that survived the coronavirus. Maybe we wouldn't be packing the concert halls, but maybe we would uh, be demanding outdoor concerts or, so- or socially distanced concerts. You know, the, mm-hmm. the, the work that has not been done reflects in um, the reality we're seeing today. Not everyone is hurting during mm-hmm. uh, this coronavirus pandemic, but orchestras are. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. So you haven't you haven't seen any orchestras uh, doing what you're talking about in terms of uh, just more cultural appropriate programming and more like different types of outreach. You you don't you haven't witnessed, witnessed that at all. I hate to I, I hate to um, pat an orchestra on the back because I feel like this um, isn't doing the good uh, the good thing as much as it's doing the right thing. You know, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. imperative measures using um using access to make equitable um decisions so um yes there are orchestras um that are doing uh, some good things but i think it's very important that we always frame those conversations around this being what has to be done because of what hasn't been done mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah uh, this is all i'm trying to take all this in this is a lot of information it's a lot of new information for me uh I think I remember in an episode that I listened to of Triloquy, I think it was during the Triloquy, Triloquy uh, your your co-host Scott Blankenship, he said, he mentioned an article about a famous cellist who, who kind of made the, he said the point, who made the point of all we need to do is put instruments in these kids' hands at a younger age and the problem of diversity will be solved. And and uh, you, he said you had a, you had something to say about that, and it was like in a previous episode, so I didn't hear what you had to say about that. Would you like to speak on that here? Sure. So um, you know, j- just uh, in the uh, in the spirit of of uh, transparency, that cellist was uh, Sheku Kane Mason, who mm. who who most folks know these days is this world famous black cello player. Um, I think what's important to note um, about uh, his words about putting instruments in in the uh, young folks' hands, so we have more black kids playing Brahms and Haydn. Um, that is a, for me and, and my personal opinion, you know, that that is a, a reality and opinion again rooted in that white supremacy. The idea that um, that so-called classical music, art music from Western Europe, is automatically going to make the life of a, a young black kid better you know the the idea that again these institutions um don't have the means of in uh, engaging uh, music education and education in general beyond that so um you know while we're all very happy for the success that sheku kane mason has uh seen um as a uh, purveyor um and as a performer of uh western um european uh classical music i think the the, the conversation has to has to go beyond that we need sheku kane mason in the spaces that um he and habits mm-hmm. um there are there are more spaces than that that need mm-hmm. our voices mm-hmm. can i can i push back on that a little bit uh what 
what about something like El Sistema, the, the pro and Yola now in the United States, but how El Sistema taking these kids from impoverished neighborhoods who, you know, likely wouldn't stand a chance at making it in the world or having success, getting away from gang violence, getting away from abusive homes through class, so-called classical music, through Western training and the well, impact it's had on their lives. Yeah, think think about all of the um, famous. Um, so l- let's go to the uh, Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra. You know, yeah. let's think about all of the performances uh, by that group that get all of the hits and that get all of the um, attention. They're mm-hmm. the concerts, at least in my experience, they're the concerts that speak to the culture of those kids and to the families of those kids who are engaging that um, th- that experience. So um, while uh, I will agree with the point you're making. I think that it uh, has to be noted that uh, those are more culturally competent experiences than we see in other parts of the world. We sure. aren't seeing we aren't seeing um, El Sistema um, uh, based programs in black communities engaging black music in mm-hmm. the same way that uh, the Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra uh, down there has uh, engaged the music of those communities, if, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. No, it does. Very good point. That's a very good point. So uh, back to the concept of culturally relevant education. Yeah, because yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm thinking back to watching those recordings. They're playing, you know, Dan Zons and everything by famous South American composers and the audience, the pan to the audience, people are dancing uh, and cheering and throughout the concert. I think, I mean, that. Like, I guess we can get on that. That is really something that I would love to see more playing, you know, back to the orchestra being super stuffy. There's sometimes where you finish playing a movement from a, an orchestra a symphony and it, it, you know, has this like really amazing emotional ending. And then it's just like silence to pay reverence to, I don't know, the dead composer or the, the orchestra, or they're worried about breaking the orchestra's focus. But like, I want people to applaud there. Like I want, you know, just like at your, at any other concert where you just show appreciation in the moment when you're feeling that appreciation, how, how do you, how do we start seeing that? Well, I mentioned earlier the, um, the performance on YouTube of, of Louis Farrakhan playing the opening movement of the right. Mendelssohn concerto. Mm-hmm. They were engaged in that because they were engaged with him and, and actually having a reaction to the music. I've played um, plenty of concerts where folks react uh, to the music in a non-traditional way mm-hmm. because those reactions were um, organic. As incredible as, uh, l- l- let, me, let me think of an example, as incredible as the um, the uh, third movement of of uh, Chike Six is, you know, the, the, this big bombastic third movement. Mm-hmm. If folks aren't cheering and applauding and throwing babies uh, at the end uh, <laughs> of that, that just means that's not the music that elicited that response. Because mm-hmm. let's face it, at the end of that third movement, you hear silence. If Beyonce walks out on stage, do you think it'll be that same silence? Right. Certainly no, not of upon the stage. Yeah. So we need to think about what well, you know. And this takes us back to the the. Um, idea of programming. We need to think about what programming is actually going to be relevant, the programming that's actually going to elicit those responses. And I think the hard pill that a lot of institutions have to swallow is that in more uh, cases than not, that music, that programming is not what we have been engaging for uh, for far too long. We need to not be afraid of, of the idea of, um, again, as I mentioned as an example, a Drake Pops taking the front seat to um, a Beethoven subscription concert. Mm -hmm. We really need to have the courage to take the concert hall and make it into something that uh, is inclusive of more of us. That may even mean that um, the the idea of an orchestra has to uh, change or or even go away. But uh, if if the ultimate goal for these institutions is to engage more people and engage more people authentically, I think Mm -hmm. those are conversations that we won't be so afraid of. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would certainly would love to play in an orchestra that was playing behind Beyonce. I, I remember at the Hollywood Bowl, I played in an orchestra behind Jennifer Hudson, and that was amazing. I played behind Chic, and that was uh, like one of the most mind blowing m- moments of my life, just like playing behind them and watching them. Between movements, or were they interacting with the performance? They were dancing, yeah, dancing the whole time, and that, and those are the best performances. But the the sad thing was, like, while me and the other percussionists were jamming out and having the best time there were people in other sections of the orchestra leaving the stage because it was too loud for them and they were and they made a huge stink about it and so i guess yeah i guess there's a there's a tough road ahead 
for sure. Well, you know, and, and for those folks leaving the stage, I think the field is um, competitive enough to um, for, for that not to be an issue. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess that's an issue with tenure. You know, I get we can open that whole can of worms, but sure, um, sure. <laughs> but we're, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have a show tonight. Is there anything else uh, we haven't touched that you'd like to speak about? Um, I, I don't think so. I would really just, you know, in closing here, uh, encourage everyone to challenge what you have always considered truth, especially when it comes to um, what you were taught. Um, think, think about think about the fact that so many of us grew up as kids thinking of Christopher Columbus as this hero who discovered America, mm-hmm. and and sort of growing up to to see that that wasn't at all the case, you know. Yeah. Uh, apply that level of critique to um, your your music theory classes. You know, what corrals are being used for you to learn what Roman numeral analysis is? And are those corrals, are those songs, are those melodies relevant to you? You know, mm-hmm. think about uh, the role you play um, in your job in or outside of music. In what ways are you actively fighting against racism? In what ways are you an anti-racist in every uh, in, in every way that it shows itself. Um, I, I really uh, I really think that level of critique will will take us um, to the next step. And then um, if I also may just plug um, all of my things. Yes, if you please want to, do. And, Where can people find you? Yeah, if you if you want to join me uh, for music through the night, I host uh, from uh, I host from, uh, Wednesday through Saturday, uh, midnight to six a.m. Central. I'm nationally syndicated to about three hundred public radio stations. If you don't live uh, in in one of those cities, you can join me at yourclassical.org/radio. Um, I also host the uh, Triloquy podcast. New opuses come out. Um, uh, Wednesday evening to Thursday morning, depending on uh, when we um, when we get things done. Officially Thursdays, but um, oftentimes you'll have those on Wednesdays. You can find that um, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also visit uh, triloquy.org, T-R-I-L-L-O-Q-U-Y dot O-R-G. And then for um, anything else about me, you can just take a look at my website. I'm at garrettmcqueen.com. Great. Well, Garrett... That was uh, certainly eye-opening for me and very informative. I can't tell you how thankful I am that you agreed to come talk to me today, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. So that certainly gives us a lot to think about, right? Uh, I hope we can all take some time and really let that soak in, especially the the last bit that Garrett was talking about, uh, You know, really kind of critiquing your perception of things what is relevant to you uh you know we're all stuck at home tomorrow's the fourth of july we're supposed to be selling celebrating our independence uh, but also on the subject of independence that's not the same for every everybody not everybody has been privy to that independence so maybe tomorrow while we're stuck at home or while you're watching fireworks from your porch or your balcony maybe take some time tomorrow for some self-reflection and really don't be afraid to be vulnerable with yourself. Don't be afraid to be uncomfortable. I think it's important to be uncomfortable and uh, you'll get through to the other side and you'll be better for it. So I will certainly be doing that and I will see you here next week, next Friday, 5 p.m., same time. Until then, be well and bye for now.